In the 1960s, Hawaii was known as a magical place, a place where tourists could enjoy the sand, the surf, the hula dancers, and Danny Kalikini. For 30 years, Hawaii's ambassador of aloha welcomed the world to the Hala Terrace at the Kahala Hilton, and he did it in a way that everyone could understand. He hanoa i aloha kakoa pau. Aloha. He mai mai komo mai na ohana ke ia. Ah, sumi mese. Konbawa. Hawaii ni yoroshiko makote ni doun arigato gozaimashita. Magadana gabi. Komo shita? Mabuti. Ni salamat po juste agi na. Onya haseo. I cheka hanguk saramini da. I sehi pamani parushim sheo. Kamsa hamne da. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Oh, when I eat that, oh, eh. Maruru roa. Parahi. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Walk up to any Hawaii resident and say, Aloha. Chances are they'll recognize the trademark greeting of Hawaii's own Kaniela, Danny Kalikini. Anyone who was anyone stayed at the Kahala Hilton and they all went to see Danny. But like many people of renown, Danny Kalikini, an entertainer with an international following, had humble beginnings. How did your life start out? Well, I started out with uh doing a prayer every morning to Akua, to God, and I thank Him for the breath of life, and that, you know, to give me the strength to survive, because that was, that was our number one goal, to survive every day, coming from where I came from, Hawaiian homestead, Papakulea. What was life like when you were a little kid in Papakulea? What do you remember? I remember growing up in Papakulea, my ohana, my family, you know, we, we didn't have much, but the best part is, we didn't know we didn't have much. <laughs> well, how many of, the, of them were you? I mean, well, how, how many people? A total of eight plus two. So, you know, so we had one big family plus. How many bedrooms? Only two. We, we survived, and I think that was the most important. Uh, well, are you saying you didn't have enough to eat? Oh, we had plenty to eat. We could go in the backyard. We had the guavas. We had the sweet potatoes. We had the vives. I mean, you know. And I, I tell everybody, I said, at home, for all the holidays, man, I said, we had hot dog for turkey, hot dog for Christmas, hot dog for New Year's. And, you know, I, I finally got invited to a Thanksgiving dinner at my friend's house, and you know, they serve turkey, and I go, what is this? They go, that's turkey. I said, you folks don't have hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> they go, what do you mean hot dog? I said, I thought, no, turkey is for Thanksgiving. <laughs> So when, <laughs> so when you say you work to survive every day, what was tough about survival? Well, I think, you know, coming from, from Popocola, I, I started, you know, my oldest brother and I, we used to go sell newspapers. I was only about six years old. And, uh, you know, walk from Popocola all the way down to Bishop and, and uh, King Street, go sell We had the corner over there. How old was your brother? My brother was, uh, he was eight. So eight and six, walking all yeah, the way yeah, down yeah. there. Yeah, so, but, you know, but he, he was, Akama, he was my oldest brother, and he, Newspaper was only five cents on an advertiser. He told me, he said, bro, sell three papers, and the next paper is for us. So he said, make sure when I sell the three papers, put the, the, three, the 15 cents in your pocket, and the other one put in your left pocket. That's the one we're going to take home. And that's how I learned. You know, I, I tell you, well, what an education, you know, just, but, you know, then I would end up, you know, we both, end up with like 35, 40 cents for the day. That was big money for us. What you know, did you do with it? Give to my mother, you know. That's what we took it home, that was the main thing. And then then we got, oh, we're gonna be enterprising. So we're gonna shine shoes. We, we shine shoes by Hawaii Theater. We couldn't pass Hawaii Theater because that side belonged to all the family from Palama Settlement. We stayed on this side of Hawaii Theater, we belonged to People from Papakulea, Kakako, and you know, so we, everybody knew where they could go and where they couldn't and go. And nobody ever tried to take over the other no, one's no, area? No, everybody, those days, everybody got, had everything going on that time. I mean, had all the gambling and everything else. I mean, you know, it was, it was interesting, you know. 
You but, saw a lot as a little kid. Yeah, but you know, that's how you, that kind of education, you could never buy. The old days, you know, they were, I mean, you could sit down and cook out with these guys, you could talk story, you know, and it, it, that was, that's, that, that, you know, when you talk about Hanai adoption and about Ohana and family, because, you know, going to school, everybody was wearing long pants and I was still wearing short pants. Why is that? Couldn't afford? We couldn't afford, and no. you know what? Just to buy one was like four bucks, man. You know, and it was big money. So I went, I was shining shoes, and so I went to this place called Chris. You ever heard of Oh, Chris? yeah. So I walked out with the long pants, and the, the manager was following me. <laughs> he goes, uh, excuse me, uh, you have something that belongs to me? I go, no. He's, oh, really? Uh, What's, what's under your shirt? <laughs> so you tried to get yourself a long yeah, so pants. Yes, I said, oh, I said, I'm sorry. I said, you know, I said, I, I said, I always wanted one long pants and I couldn't, you know, I said, what's four dollars? Then he said, because he knew I was shining shoes down by Hawaii Theater. He, 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 he saw me. Anyway, he says, uh, you know, you cannot walk in here and take things, you know, without paying for it, you know. He said, you go in jail, you know. That. You know, I said, yeah, I, I saw her and I never, he said, so I told him, I said, but I, I, I get, I get about 30 cents I made today, you know, from, from selling this paper. So I, so I said, I can give you the 30 cents. He said, well, you come down and you pay up for the, make up for the whole four dollars. You take these pants now, okay? But you come up and you make sure, I used to go, Every day, every other day, I only had 25 cents, but I go, oh, and I paid up for the pants. You know, that, that's how, but I never forgot. I mean, you know, I mean, these are the, when you talk about Ohana family, I mean, that's how we all, everybody came together. I mean, that, that's the word, Hanai. We adopted each other, so we, we could. And Did you feel deprived? No. I mean, you didn't have what, what you wanted. No, but I think, you know, I think most important we had we had you know we had each other you know my father worked uh, for the city and county he was refugee department my mother was a cocktail waitress but we all survived and you know the thing is we all came together Ohana family and there was the Kanekapila in the backyard you know I mean we had no idea what we were doing you know sing songs we sing all the Hawaiian songs I mean I mean I mean that's all we say and uh, I, I know that. Uh, my grandfather, you know, we had to learn passages from the Bible, sing the church songs, and I said, oh, this is, you know, I said, when I get big, I want to be a truck driver, you know. And my grandfather said, oh, terrific. You don't want to learn, you don't want to sing, then you don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I like to eat, I know all the church songs. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, you know, amazing, you know. That. Did you want to be a truck driver? Oh, yeah. I, well, you know, when you grew up, that, especially in, you go work for the city and county, refuge department, they have credit union, <laughs> and you're going to get, you know, I mean, that was the thing, everybody. Otherwise, you, you can go work for the telephone company, you know. But city and county was the best. <laughs> and that's what your dad did. So yeah. that's what you wanted to do too? Well, I, thought, I figured, well, yeah, but I figured, oh, well, I'm going to be a rubbish man. You know, not too bad. I'm going to have, I get income. I can borrow money from the credit union, you know. But yeah, that was, you know, part of growing up. And then, you know, not knowing that there were, besides that, other things outside of that, you know, you could pursue, but it's, it was up to you. Truck driver, city and county worker, honorable ways to make a living, support a family. Danny Kalikini's life was headed in that direction. But if there's a common thread that runs through the lives of so many of our Long Story Short guests, it is that collection of decisions and people and moments in time that, when viewed individually, can seem insignificant. And yet, the impact of these seemingly isolated factors make the difference between a regular life and a life that is as big as the world's. I got to be honest with you. I really wanted to attend Kamehameha School. Coming from Papakulea, Hawaiian Homestead, I thought, you know, one of us 
with eight of us in the family, one of us would be accepted, you know, being Hawaiian, Kanakama only. Well, we tried and you know, we, we all went to public school, got an education. And uh, I went to rural school, elementary. Then I went to Kauana Nakoa. I even ran for student body president. Well, what was your platform? I ran against the smartest guys in school. One was Korean, one was Japanese, and one was Hawaiian. The Hawaiian guy was Robert Kihuni. Okay, you know him. Admiral. So they all get up and they dress nice, they wear shoes, and they, they gave the, made their presentation. Here comes the boy from Papakolea, bare feet, I get salamoko pants, choke bottom pants, you know, and rip, I get up there and I go, you heard all the guys talk? I said, whatever they said, I'm gonna do better, so just let me sing you a song. <laughs> <laughs> and you won. I won. <laughs> I, it was all the girls voted for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was so unreal, man. You know, so I became the student body president. And, uh, but after I graduated, going on the course, I said, they said, well, you, you're going to have to go to McKinley. I said, no way. That's Oriental school, you know. They said, well, then you go Friday. And I said, no way. Then I, then I have to sing Dayo Sayon, you know. <laughs> you know. I said, how about Roosevelt? They said, it's an English standard school. It, you cannot just walk in there. You got to take a test, and you know, and, and they, you know, because it's English standard, they use some of the biggest and the hardest and the harsh words that you never saw in your life. So my grandfather said, "Hey, go take the test." He said, "English is like Hawaiian, as big as the word is. Cut them up, make them short." He said, "You know, no worry, no poiva, no be makao, don't be afraid." So I said, "Okay, I'm gonna take the test." prepared myself. I wore socks with my shoes and I go in there, take the test, open the test. Oh, I had perspiration coming out. I saw the longest English word I ever saw in my life. The word was aspiration. Oh, I said, no puiva, no makao, don't get afraid, Canela. Cut them up, make them shut. Oh, I get them. I put them down. Aspiration. If you have headache, take two. <laughs> they said, we want you. You're very creative. <laughs> you know, you said you don't want to go to McKinley because it's the Oriental school. Well, you're, you're Korean Chinese. It, it sounds like you were raised in a very Hawaiian No, my atmosphere. oldest brother went there. My, my father went there. You know, my uncles, everybody went to McKinley. So I said, I wanted to go. Come here, man. They said, cannot. Then for everything, I said, oh, because all my family went to Farrington High School. I mean, you know, it was, it was, it was most unreal, but, but Roosevelt was, was mostly military, you know. So you just wanted to go someplace nobody else had gone in your family? Yeah, and, then, and they said they had the, the good-looking girls. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be a recurrent theme here. <laughs> they said the good-looking girls all went to Roosevelt. <laughs> there are people who attended Roosevelt with you who, who, who made a name for themselves in organized crime. Yeah, we all you know we all came out together. This was in the 50s, but we're all family. We're all related to one another. But you know, everybody has to do what they had to do. You know, they they chose that destination, and I went this destination, and yeah. But we still come together, Lokahi United. Why do you think you didn't go the same way? Well, you know, I I, I had a I wanted to really pursue music, you know, because after being involved with the music with the choir and everything else. And I said, God, I, I, I can really make a go at music. You know, Did you get any peer pressure from them? No, they, we talked about it. And they, so one guy says, hey, let him go sing. Let him go. He'll do good. You know, he, can, he can talk. He can sing. You know, we just support him. And they did. When your grandfather said, you, you got to sing if you want to eat, did you have any sense that you had a really good voice? No. I guess, you know, because we just, everybody sang, we, you know, was, we had no idea un until I went to Roosevelt High School and I met my music teacher, Miss Elda Coit Lee. She said, young man, you should come and try out for the choir. I said, no way. I said, I said you know, it's not for guys like us, you know. She said, you have a beautiful voice, but you know. And I, so I went in at the choir and I started, and I learned the, the the final points of, you know, 
uh, you know, singing and, you know. And she heard, heard you in the hallways or something? Yeah, she heard me, you know, just, I was singing with, you know, you know, sitting down in the corner and mm -hmm. singing with all the guys, you know. And uh, she said, you, and then I said, oh, I said, I must go give it. And I went in, I, I really liked, I really enjoyed it, you know. Then I became part of the octet, you know, the special group, and, uh, and that's how I got involved with music, you know, really got involved with music. Then really kind of turned it around for me. At this point in Danny's life, things are beginning to pick up speed. His skills as a singer and entertainer are developing. This is usually the point in a prodigy's career where he or she thinks that it's all about them. But listen closely to what he says. Danny knows that he didn't get where he is alone. And even now, as he reflects in 2010, at the age of 72, Danny Kalikini has not forgotten anyone who lent him a helping hand. Who was in your high school class that people might remember today? Ron Jacobs, Wesley Park. You know, and Wesley was my you know, business manager because of Wesley Park, and I thank him very much. He got me my job at the Kahala Hilton in 1967. He got me a contract for, for five years, and the rate was $1.5 million. Wow. I was guaranteed, which is unheard of. You know, I, I tell you, Leslie, before I went to Kahala, I had learnings from the best from Hawaii. I started at places, and I want to thank people like, when I was Shining Shoes, I used to go every Fridays, Right across Hawaiian Electric was Charlie's Taxi. And they had jam session, Jesse Kalima and the Thousand Pounds of Melody. Oh. So my brother and I would go there just about 5.30 with, with, our, with our shoeshine box. Then he would say, hey, the two brothers from Papukula, come on here, sing us a song. We go up there, we sing our song, oh, Makala, boo. <laughs> you know, after the song, people would throw all, we pick up like two or three dollars, man, you know. Oh, I mean, so we, take it to, to Jesse. He said, no, no, you guys take that home for you. And I tell you, never forgot, you know, but, you know they, then I got in. I went to work at uh, Waikiki Sands, was owned by Rudy Tong, and they had the only ladies Hawaiian band, Lena Ala Ignacio, and it, that's uh, uh, Cipriano's mother, okay? But she had the Hawaiian shows there, so I, I go there, and I, I never forgot the Chinese manager. Go, go clean your table, go. So I go clean the table. Go sing your song. I go, go sing. My, I sang my song, but, but you know, sometimes I, I make 50 cents deep, you know, and I, I was, and I, after I get through, I had to walk home to Papa Kolea because the bus closed by, I think, 10 o'clock. So I, then I, from there, Ray Keeney saw me, and he took me to the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Then he says, you watch what I do, he says, you're gonna learn. Then I learned how to be an MC, and you know. What was the most important thing to, you learned in being an MC? Well, not to rush to take it, you know. And you can. The more you rush, and the, you know, and you just take your time because that way you you double talk and you 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 say things three, four times the same thing. So he just said, just take your time, you know. Be sure what you know. Good. My, my, kuma, my, aloha. Tonight, we just want you to enjoy yourself, relax, as we bring you the music of Hawaii. Nani Hawaii kamu. And then you mm -hmm. went, you know, but I, I learned, you know, and timing was so important. So from, from the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, I was there with Ray Kinney. Then I went to, uh, to the Hawaiian Village. Uh, Joe Flanders was there, you know, she, and at that time, because uh, I was doing the luau shows, mm -hmm. then when Alfred Apaka passed away, you know, they were looking. I think they had several people: Jimmy Kaina, uh, Jimmy Moikeha. Then I I came in. I was doing the luau shows. Then I came in to work within the topper room, and then then it, it happened for me to go to the Kahala. Wesley found the contract for me. To, to move to the Kahala Hilton. Now, how did he get the chops to get a contract with the Kahala? Well, obviously, you know, being with the, in, in the business world, you know, and he, you know, I learned in life, uh, you can be the smartest guy, you can have all the degrees in the world, but if you don't have that association, 
You know, that's the key to success. And I learned that in life. But Wesley had, you know, he knew a lot of people, you know, he knew all the business people. And Bob Burns was the, the new general manager. He came in and Wesley met Bob Burns and they talked together and he says, you know, and he said, guarantee that, you know, we're gonna do a good job. But it seems like both you and your business partner, Wesley Park, you're able to get along with people, lots of different people. You don't have to really know them well or understand them, but you can you, you find a basis and you you're, you're able to bridge well. Well, the combination is you know you know you cannot have two poopaki keys, two hard heads working together. You know, you need you need one in, in intellectual and you need one that you know can do the job but listen at the same time. You know, I mean, I always thought, oh, I don't need him. You know, I can do it myself. It never worked. Because I, I knew if I took on that project, I would fail. Because I don't had I didn't have the business knowledge. You need people. You need support. And I, you know, it's like you know coming together. You know, but everybody has the expertise. But you gotta listen to what they have to share. You know, and I and I, I was fortunate that you know I had people like two people that really supported me was Larry Dolom, the owner of Wholesome Bakery. How'd you know him? I was his newspaper boy. I used to deliver papers to his house in Punchbowl. I was, I, that was my route there. And the, Mr. Sullivan from Foodland, he was close to Larry. They were both, you know, Foodland and Wholesome Bakery. They worked closely together. And, and so I got to meet, you know, two of them and they supported me and they, they wanted to make sure that, you know, the business part. Then the other guy was Mr. John Bellinger, you know, First Hawaiian Bank. I mean, he was tough, he was rugged. I mean, I remember when I, f I got involved with, you know, going to the Kahala site, so I, I called his office and his secretary says, who's calling? He said, oh, Kaniala. Oh, Danny. I, I said, can I speak to Mr. Bellinger? She said, oh, wait, he's busy. Wait, wait, hang on. So he gets on the phone. What do you want? I go, oh, Mr. Bellinger, I, I want to make an album. So? Uh, but, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have the, the finances. He said, then don't make them. <laughs> I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> he said, come down here now. He said, How you? <laughs> get your calling down here. And he helped you? Yeah, they sponsored my first album. <laughs> <laughs> Who else helped you along the way? Oh, I, I you know, I, 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 I got to thank Reverend Akaka, you know. And Danny Akaka, when I went to Kauai, was my minister of music. So I was part of, you know, the, the choir. And... Uh, but Kaho, you know, is really the one that taught me about that magic word, aloha. And, you know, and uh, the ukulele, you know, he told me the ukulele represents the world. You know, there's only four strings, but each string represents all the different people that make up our world, black, white, yellow, brown. He said, you play each string, you'll get a song, you know. But try playing it all together, you know. Then you find a chord, then you find harmony, then we can all come together, you know. What was it like? Do you remember the moment when you realized, I am going to play the Kahala? Oh, no, I, I, I was so scared. I mean, that was like, it was like one step beyond, you know, to go from, from downtown Waikiki to I was, and Kahala was, you know, the Hilton International was, I mean, premier. Did you replace anybody when you went to the, to the Kahala showroom, or no. did you create that showroom? I created the show. I created the room. So, what did what was the thinking process in figuring what will work in the showroom? Well, first of all, I said we were too far from Waikiki. I said we had to work hard to get people, because just to catch the tax in, and the local people said, Kahala Hilton, you know how much the cup coffee? One dollar. You know? Well, who do, who were you playing to? I mean, what what did you want your audience to be? Well, Locals I had no idea. and I w tourists. I, I wanted the tourists. But that's why Wesley and everybody else says, you know, go get the local people, you know. So as a way to get the tourists. And then, you know, then, and I tell you, I thank God, the local people, holiday supported. They would have their Christmas parties. They would have all the events, you know. And, you know, they would come. I mean, they would come like 60, 75 one time, but, you know. But we had come in rates for them. Well, oh, how did you draw them in? What was your, what, what do you think brought them in? I did it Hawaiian style. I mean, you know, 
I did it from from the poo-poos, you know, and, and all the kanaka mo'olis, you know, I'm just to sing, uh, I mean, ua liki no liki, I, I did le uh, le makamai, you know, because, but I did all the, even like, Andy Anderson was one of, I, I love and Mr. Anderson, I love his songs, and I used to sing Malahini Mele, you know, and I, and everybody used to get a bang, because I used to add my own words to it, you know, and, uh, but it, you know, the thing was an upbeat tune. You Real hapahali. All the hapahali yeah. songs, and I tell you, I mean, and every night I, I sang the wedding song, and the other song was either Lovely Hula Hands or Beyond the Reef, either one. Yeah, and everybody knew the song. Not only the, the uh, Malahinis, but the Kamainis as well, you know, because Lovely Hula Hands, and the Anderson wrote that song, you know. So you started out with a local crowd, and then what happened? And then, you know, then, then the, the tourists started to come from Waikiki. Then I, then I had to go market the show. Then I started to get the, the Japanese. Once the Japanese, you could not, the second show was sold out every night. It was unreal. And thus began a run of shows that most likely will never be equaled in Hawaii entertainment. We'll talk with Danny Kalaikini about his 30 years as the headliner at the Kahala Hilton in an upcoming episode. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. I went to the senior prom took this girl, but I was playing in a dance orchestra. We had a 16-piece orchestra. We were called the Teen Towners. I was the drummer, I was the trumpet player, and I was also the vocalist, so you know. So I had a big part in the band, so I took this girl and I said, you know, I'm gonna have to play the first two sets, and I said, but the third set, I can come back and we can have a dance together. So, you know, and those days, you know, I, I bought a Carnation Lay the five dollars. Those cost. big red ones. Five bucks cost me. You know that. So anyway, so I took her and playing. I came back and I, I go, where's my date? She, she said, the, 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 they said, oh, she called her father to come pick her up because she said you're boring. You know. I, I said what? She left. I said for real. And she took my lay. <laughs> <laughs> I paid five bucks for that lay. <laughs> Two story. <laughs>